Welcome to TYT Interviews, another fascinating interview for you guys today. We're going to talk to two people. Brandon Bryant, uh, he's a former drone operator for the United States Air Force and a whistleblower. And Tanya Hessen Shea, who uh, directed the documentary film Drone. Imagine killing more than 1,500 enemies in war without ever stepping foot on the battlefield. The drones have changed everything. It's the defining weapon of the war on terror. It's never been easier for an American president to carry out a killing operation at the ends of the earth. We are safer because of our efforts. These strikes have saved lives. I didn't really understand what it meant to kill at first. We sat in a box. We we're the ultimate peeping toms. You never know who you're killing because you never actually see a face. 1,626 people were killed in the operations that I took part of. How many of them do you think were innocent? I'm the only one that really is vocal about it. It just blows my mind. War is an unbelievably profitable business. The military has invested in video games as recruiting tools. How do we find our 18X pilots? How do we identify these people early? I had no idea what I was in for. I wasn't even 20 years old at that point. The United States is violating one of the most fundamental rights of all, the right to life. The truth is the vast majority of people have no earthly idea what's happening here. It is not justifiable killing unarmed, innocent civilians. As a former RPA drone operator, I have concerns about how the drone community operates. The U.S. has to explain what went wrong. Drones have not caused a huge number of civilian casualties. We've seen them make mistakes by the hundreds. The rescuers would come in, and the CIA was coming back and bombing again. I believe the United States of America must remain a standard bearer in the conduct of war. It's just point. Brandon is featured in that movie, and uh, the movie has won uh, Best Norwegian Documentary at the Bergen uh, International Film Festival, won the Norwegian Peace Film F uh, Award, won the Cinema for Peace Award at the Berlin International Film Festival as well. Uh, Brandon and Tanya, uh, great to have you on the Young Turks. Good to be. Thank you for having us. Okay, lots of questions for you guys. Brandon, let me start with you. Um, so, when did you join the Air Force? Uh, and uh, what were you expecting? I joined the Air Force in July 5th, 2005, and I expected to be able to get my education at relatively little cost to myself. So y you grew up in uh, Montana, right? Correct. And you, uh, you had a single mom, uh, and did you have any other way of uh, paying for education if it wasn't for the United States Air Force? No. I could have taken out student loans if I wanted to get into massive amounts of debt. Right. And how old were you when you joined the Air Force? 19. Did they start training you on drones right away, or how long did that process take? Uh, that didn't start until April, 16, uh, April 12th of 2006. And um, I actually didn't in, uh, join in the drone program. I was conscripted into it. Um, so I joined as an intelligence uh, imagery analyst. I originally wanted to be a SEER specialist, but um, they needed mean? more intel people. Um, SEER specialists are survival experts for the U.S. Air Force. Mm -hmm. um, but I scored so high on my tests that they wanted me to be in intelligence. And so they shoveled me into the intelligence career field. And then once I graduated that career, um, they told us, well, we're going to send you to Nevada, but we're not going to tell you what you're going to do, and you won't find out until you get there. So I didn't know until I stepped onto station in Creech Air Force Base exactly what I was going to do. So when when you were uh, signing up for the Air Force, uh, they gave you a general spiel, right? They they never told you you were going to operate drones and and drop bombs on people. Correct. Right. On the other hand, it's the United States Air Force. Uh, you had to know that they're that at some point, you might get to a point where you're dropping bombs on people. 
I'm, I really never thought about it. I knew that I could be in a position where I would need to use maybe weapons if I was going to be forward deployed, like right, rifles or pistols or whatever. And uh, that I didn't have an issue with because it was, you know, direct fight for one's survival and one's life. It was, uh, plus I believe, I believed in the system at that time. You know, I believed in what we were doing and I didn't really have any education on what else was going on. And so um, it didn't really cross my mind that I would be dropping bombs from 10,000 miles away onto people and people that I had no idea who they were. When you first found out that that is what you were going to do in the drone program, um, what was your reaction to that? I went to my commander and I told him that I couldn't do it, but he told me that I should stop being a fucking pussy and should do my job. Okay, and so you started doing your job. By the end, how many people do you think you'd killed? I killed 13 directly um, with uh, Hellfire missile strikes and I was party to over 1,600 people uh, being killed in actions directly related to what we participated in. When you say you were a party to that, what do you mean by that? That means that it could have been either bombs from another aircraft, it could, be, it could have been guys on the ground killing individuals. Uh, we were just part of those missions where and did direct support for those missions that people died. Uh, and of the 1,600, I think in 26, according to my notes, people that you were party to killing, um, how many of them were terrorists? Because we're assured by the U.S. government that almost all of them were. Uh, I don't know, actually. That's kind of one of the biggest part parts of the guilt that uh, <clears throat> stick with you is that um, my name is associated with that number. I have, a, I have a certificate. There's a database with my name associated with that number and more numbers, and I have no idea who those people are. I don't even know who the people are that I killed myself. Um, I was just told that they were enemies to the United States and they, they hated us for our freedoms, they hated us for our religion or whatever excuse that they, they wanted us to believe. And um, I just don't know. And do you think there might have been any kids in that number? Yeah. I'm more than positive. Is it just a matter of probability or do you know for certain? Well, I watched uh, the video actually from three years ago where you mentioned me, <clears throat> and uh, you actually um, talked about how we c we call military aged males um, as anyone anyone who is military aged is eligible to be a, a combatant over there. So we're looking at ages twelve and up, and um, doesn't matter if they're children or not at that point if they're not with the women then they are considered military aged male and legal combatant, so they're considered enemy uh, targets. I hear there's atrocious phrases such as fun sized terrorists for children and cutting the grass before it grows, uh, talking about killing children before they get to be adults. Uh, to what degree is that true? Is that is that something that one person ever said or is that a thing that's said fairly regularly? Uh, there's, there's those extremist guys that, um, that say those things. It's not actually everyone that says it, but those phrases are kind of said and then ignored. I never heard fun size terrorists, that was another squadron, but I did hear mowing the grass before it grows as when, hey, when if, if kids are going to be there, then we might as well prevent them from being terrorists later on. And that was kind of the, the excuse given to us. Okay, Brandon, it's an amazing story. Obviously, I'm going to come back and talk to you more about this in a second. Let me bring in Tanya here who did the whole documentary. So first, Tanya, just give us some background on what the documentary is about. Obviously, Brandon's in it, uh, but w what else is in the doc? Well, uh, drone is about the, the CIA drone warfare. Uh, we're mainly focusing on Pakistan. Um, but for us, it was very important to hear the voices on both sides of the drones. So we follow people that have survived drone attacks or lost their loved ones uh, in drone strikes. And we also follow uh, drone pilots to see what it is to be a drone pilot and what it really means to, to kill with a joystick. And then, uh, you know, their stories uh, are put in perspectives by some of the most foremost uh, experts uh, on the drone war. So a lot of Americans feel uh, pretty good about the drone program. It has high popularity here. 
because they feel that it's risk-free. I mean, you're sitting in Tampa or wherever you are in Central Command and pressing a button, at least Brandon's life, other uh, you know, U.S. Air Force uh, members' lives are not in danger. And they feel like it's more targeted than a ground invasion or uh, the old, what they call dumb bombs, um, the, like the ones we dropped in Vietnam. So uh, is there validity to those points? I think that you know the drone is is sold as the perfect weapon in the war on terror. Uh, it's sold as surgical precise, um, and uh, you know it's cheap. You don't have to put boots on the ground uh, or your own soldiers at risk. Uh, and in that fact, it's it's a very easy war kind of warfare to sell to to the public, especially when you don't have any transparency or accountability, and you don't release information about who you really are killing. And uh, what we are showing in the film is that, you know, the, the vast majority of people that are killed are civilians. Um, and there's no information or investigations into this. Uh, and we think that the U.S. is setting an incredibly uh, dangerous precedent in their use of drones. Uh, and that's what we hope that this film uh, will, you know, bring light to. Natalia, uh, that obviously leads to the question of why. I mean, is it just we're making mis a lot of mistakes and killing uh, too many civilians. Uh, should we be more careful with the program? Uh, I, I imagine that that the people in the Defense Department are not stupid. I hope, right? And and even when you kill civilians, obviously you're going to have more people fighting against us at a later time. So why are they doing this? Uh, is it that they're not that they're careless? What's the answer here? That's a very good question. Uh, for me, the, the drone is, is sold as you know, a very short-term, um, sexy tactic, an easy kind of warfare uh, where you can kill the enemy from the other side of the world and you don't have to go into dangerous, uh, hard-to-reach places. And you also uh, can keep a lot of this uh, secret from the public. Um, and I think the lack of information and the lack of um, debate about the long-term consequences of this uh, you know, like uh, Colonel Wilkerson says in the film, um, how can you win this war if every time you kill four, you create ten? And we are not having a real debate about how the drone warfare is actually creating more uh, terrorism and, and um, encouraging people to join uh, the extreme groups. Yeah, I don't even know if it's fair to call uh, the ten uh, combatants that were creating terrorists. I mean, if somebody dropped a bomb on your wedding and killed your mom and, and kids, when you go to fight the people who dropped the bomb, is that fair to call them terrorists? I, I don't know. Absolutely. Now, yeah, that's a good point. But we are, I, according to the numbers, for every four people we kill, we create 10 combatants against us, which seems pr preposterously stupid, unless you're into endless war. Um, which, you know, there's an argument to be made that some people. Are. Uh, so, Brandon, let me bring you back in here. When your commanding officers, did they ever bother giving you justification uh, for these targets, saying who they are, so that you guys feel a little bit better? Like, hey, you really got the bad guys? Or did they just keep saying, stop being a fucking pussy and, ke and keep killing them? Oh, that kind of both. Um, they would, if you uh, brought up any issues about what was happening, they would publicly make fun of you. Um, how so? They would uh, they would call you out in during the briefing or whatever, and they'd say something like, "This person doesn't want to do this job." But I only I only saw that a couple times, and the couple times that there were people who uh, wanted to be uh, conscientious objectors were ridiculed in front of their peers. Um, and then, but to me, it really seems like a lot of these people that are in charge of this program, um, they want to, they're, they're almost like children, actually, like playing with a toy that they don't want to get caught playing with, but they, they know that eventually they're going to get caught playing with it, so they're trying to do as much with it as possible. Um, we used to call the, we used to have this term called predator porn, which uh, we, we would have high-ranking individuals come into our uh operations center and they would be transfixed by what was going on in the screen because it was they could see the battlefield live.
They could manipulate the battlefield live. There was a couple instances where we would have generals come in and they would actually ask convoys to stop and their personnel to get out, to walk along the road, to see if they could get people to attack them. Wait, like what, for fun? Uh, why, why did they, they, they wanted they wanted to see action. They wanted to see action. And these are our guys that they're putting in danger. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They don't. They don't. They do not care. They do not care about us. Now, but they say they do, Brandon. I mean, they say they're keeping you safe by doing the drone program. I, I'm curious. I mean, I, I don't think you aren't a pilot, right? You, uh, but, but if, uh, uh, if you could, would you have rather actually flown a plane and put yourself in danger rather than operating the drone? Yeah, because it doesn't. See, uh, drones seem pretty cowardly um, from any sort of war perspective, war philosophy perspective. If you look at uh, Sun Tzu's The Art of War, we're actually completely violating that entire document by uh, prolonging this war that we're fighting over there. Okay, uh, now uh, you have PTSD, right? I've been diagnosed with it. Yes. So why is that? Because you know people wonder, hey, you weren't in the combat. Where, where were you? Were you in Tampa or somewhere else when you were operating the drones? I was in Nevada, New Mexico, and Iraq. Um, but I, I wasn't, yeah, it, it's more, it's what they call moral injury. Like, I didn't understand what I was doing, but I felt that it was wrong, and I was too scared to say otherwise. Like, I'll admit it, I was scared. I was scared of my command because they would tell us things like, well, if you talk to anyone or go see a psychologist or talk to the IG, you're going to get ridiculed, you're going to lose your clearance, uh, you're going to get a dishonorable discharge. And you don't want that. If you get a dishonorable discharge from the United States military, like, you're fucked. You're fucked for life. And there's no way of fix fixing that. And so they... they would tell us these things to make us continue doing our job, but as soon as everyone's contract gets up, they get out. No one wants to deal with anyone else's bullshit. No one wants to sit there while and do this job day in and day out, and our command saying, yeah, continue leaning forward, continue doing the job, you're protecting guys on the ground, you're doing, your, you're doing an awesome job, and then our command goes off, and they party all the time, and they don't even show up to work, and they're getting flight pay. There's assholes in my chain of command who are getting flight pay for only flying once every 30 days, and I wasn't getting flight pay, and I was flying every freaking day of the week. So... Uh <clears throat> You would get a dishonorable discharge if you made the mistake of having enough honor to care about killing innocent civilians. Correct. Yeah. Well, welcome if you, to our. If you question the system, then then they would they would discharge you. So, how long is a stint there? How long did you have to stay doing this job? Uh, I signed up initially for six years, which was probably a mistake. Um, but uh, usually, people are there for two and a half to three years. Mm -hmm. um, and then their their contract either gets up. Uh, you actually, it's almost impossible to leave the drone system. We call it a black hole for a reason because once you get sucked in, you're never going to escape unless your why contracts up. Because they need people. They need people to to sit there and do the job that no one else wants to do. It's we we ta you talked about earlier about boots on the ground versus drones. People would rather be out there doing something constructive than sitting behind a monitor for 12 hours a day and staring at a computer screen watching patterns of life. And well, when you, how did you target people? When, when you, you just said patterns of life. So you see pattern of life uh, and you're, you know, sometimes you're there to extinguish it. Um, how, how do you know who to target? Uh, we, uh, we would be told. So uh, we would be watching for nefarious activity. Okay, what does um, that mean? Nefarious, nefarious activity would be whatever the person that's watching our monitors or uh, watching our signal feed saying is nefarious. Uh, I had no, I had no idea what that meant, other than someone acting suspiciously. Which are they planting a bomb in the road? Are they carrying weapons? Are they? Um, Whatever it is that they're doing is, uh, would, they would be the one to determine whether it was nefarious or not. So, Brandon, someone else determines whether what they're doing is nefarious, and and your job is to track them and then press the button. Correct. And so, I, I've 
read that it is mainly signal intelligence that they use. So you don't necessarily know the actual person uh, that that honestly you're executing. Uh, that it's based on whether they have a, the wrong cell phone on them or they have some sort of weapons, and that's why sometimes we bomb weddings because people bring weapons to weddings to fire into the air. What's yeah, your well, there, there? there has been that. It's mostly if they do use signals intelligence or the, the G mesh. You probably read the drone papers, right? Mm -hmm. um, it talks about how we had this thing called the Gilgamesh pod, and if it if it picks up a cell phone signal and geolocates a target, you look at this target, and you're most likely going to be finding someone there. And according to our intelligence uh, standard operation procedures, you have to have two sources of intel before you can action it. Signals intelligent and visual intelligence, you got it right there. And so you're most likely to be to action it once you actually see that there's something activity going on underneath that signal location. But Brandon, what counts as visual intelligence? I mean, you see somebody, what does that mean? I'm not the one that makes the determination. We have signals experts and we have in, uh, imagery experts that watch our video. Okay, got it. And one last thing in, the, in, in this round. Uh, you said a lot of the drone operators leave. In your estimation, and I know it's just an estimation, what percentage of the drone operators leave once their uh, contract is up? I'd say 85 to 90 percent. How much? 85 to 90 percent. Wow. And, and you've talked to them, obviously, you work with them. Uh, is, it, is it the same moral compunction that you were feeling? Uh, some people feel bad that they don't feel bad. Um, and there, there are quite a few people that know that what we're doing is like highly questionable. But once they leave, they don't want anything to do with it. They, they, they don't want to, to hear the word or term drone ever again. Um, they don't want to. Uh, I've had quite a few people recently contact me and tell me, good job, continue what you're doing. But they don't want to take part in it because they have, they have more at risk than I do. They have families. They have friends. They have jobs. They have all these types of things that they can't put at risk because. Yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's the same thing as Edward Snowden. Uh, if he had a family, he might not have taken the risk he did in, in being a whistleblower. And so I want to come back to you in a second and talk to, to you about uh, the what you did in whistleblowing and the consequence of that. Tanya, I, I want to ask you now, uh, what's your uh, sense of how they recruit people like Brandon? What, what's the main uh, way that they find young people willing to press that button? Well, I don't think they've really figured out how they're going to recruit the perfect drone pilot. Uh, one thing that surprised me uh, and kind of how I got into this issue was seeing how the U.S. Air Force was using video games to recruit um, new drone pilots. Uh, and gamers are a very important uh, group uh, in modern warfare. And, uh, you know, this has uh, been very, very successful. Uh, and it is spreading around the world. Uh, Germany is, um, has a high presence of military and gaming conventions, and so does Sweden and Norway. So this, this is spreading uh, worldwide. So they're going to video gaming conferences like World of Warcraft, whatever, and finding kids who are good at playing video games and say, come play video games, but except you get to kill real people? Yeah, so the, the whole thought of, you know, kids going from getting points per kill to killing real people with the same kind of interface and the same kind of joystick, uh, that sort of sparked me to, to start to look at how uh, the entertainment industry is working very, very closely with the military these days to figure out, you know, what systems work the best uh, and so forth. And then, uh, you know, the U.S. Uh, military also created America's Army, which is uh, a purely recruiting tool. Um, and this video game uh, has spread all around the world, and it's actually played by 9 million people around the world uh, today. So it's one of the most popular um, online video games. What is it called? America's Army. America's Army. And yes. how similar is it to the real-life... Uh, it's, Bombing you know, I don't know what do you think, Brandon. Um, it's, uh, I mean, they use, you know, um, real soldiers for their models, for their avatars. They use, uh, you know, real sounds. Uh, they make it as, as um, close to the, the battle feeling as, as possible. Uh, I don't, you know, I'm not a big gamer. It looks a little bit dull to me personally, but um, 
I don't know. So, Brandon, and how I, similar was it? I'm uh, I'm not a um, first person shooter fan myself, but I think that it puts uh, unrealistic expectations on um, what the battlefield actually entails because I've. I've seen it. I've experienced uh, uh, the the training aspect of it, and I wouldn't want to be a forward deployed person myself, personally. But um, it's it's just like the the drone stuff in all the video games and movies in Hollywood has been wrong. What do you mean wrong? Uh, they want to sensationalize it. They want to make it look cooler than what it really is, but. Hey, you might you might be running around on a battlefield in a video game shooting people, but you also have to remember that you're carrying uh, over 200 pounds of equipment, and your boots might be uh, chafing your feet a little bit, or you might have uh, some jock itch if you haven't been taking care of yourself, and it's dry, and um, you get dirt in your face and grit in your eyes, and it's it's a miserable experience. Um, and then you're killing real people. Too. You know, it's, um, I think that, you know, for me, like one of the most concerning things is that our uh, kids today are growing up behind screens and spend a vast amount of time uh, playing war uh, in a, in a t very twisted, um, gamified uh, version of, of war. But here war is normalized and, and killing is made to look fun and cool. Uh, I think that is something that we do have to, you know, um, have a serious discussion about, especially when war is also turned into a video game. And, and most of the drone pilots that we have talked to, you know, um, have a background from gaming and is very sort of familiar um, with the kind of uh, thinking and, and system and joystick and, and whatnot they're using. So that is a serious similarity that uh, has to be discussed. So, Brandon... I'm curious, what when you were targeting, uh, and say so it's triggered by the idea of the games as opposed to real life, what did you see? How how closely could you see people's identity? I mean, could you see a guy before you press the button? Uh, you could see their outline and their silhouette. You could see if they had a cigarette in their hand. It's it's all infrared, so you don't actually see people. You see their heat signature. Um, I like to tell I like to tell people to go go stand on a third story building and look as far down the street as you possibly can, maybe two or three blocks, and then try to make out what you see about those people. It's pretty much the same thing. Was there ever were there ever moments when uh, you guys are about to execute a mission and somebody goes, "Whoa, whoa, wait, wait, wait! It's not who we thought it was." Or wait, there's a kid in the area. Did that ever happen? There's, there was a couple times where I saw the abort happen, um, but I never, it wasn't very common. It wasn't, it was usually like the, someone we're targeting is moving along and he stops to talk to someone on the street and we're not sure, usually a vehicle, uh, um, but really, no, never never really saw someone say, whoa, this is the wrong person, or this is, we shouldn't be targeting this individual. It was usually once the decision came to strike someone, it was going to happen no matter what anyone else thought about it. Did you ever think, this guy doesn't know it, uh, or this person doesn't know it, but this is the last seconds of their life? Oh, yeah. Uh, the, first, the first time that I took a shot, actually, um, I watched the guy bleed out of his leg and roll around on the ground, and I was wondering what his last thoughts were. You know, as I watched him die, I watched him die from my action, and I was the only thing that I could think of was what were this man's last thoughts. And then my last Hellfire shot that I had, we killed five people that were sleeping, and you know, a very similar thing. Like, what were they? What were they thinking about before they went to sleep? What were they dreaming about before they died? Yeah, you know, a, a lot of tough guys, uh, fake tough guys, say like, "Oh yeah, nighty night, we got them, ha ha." But taking somebody's life is no joke, and uh, and I think that's obviously why eighty-five to ninety percent of the drone operators leave because that's that's a heavy, heavy thing to weigh on your conscience, uh, especially if you're not exactly positive who you're killing. Um, yeah. So, 
What, what was the difference between the 13 that you said you were directly responsible for as opposed to the over 1,600 that you were somehow involved in? So the 13 was uh, five shots where I pointed a laser at a target and guided a weapon from our own aircraft to the target location. The uh, others, um, there's an instance in 2008 where um, I lay, I uh, buddy lay, what we call a buddy lays, where I lazed a target and another aircraft dropped a bomb on this target. So that doesn't count as something directly from myself that counts as in support of. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and what did you blow the whistle on, Brandon? Uh, what exactly did you report and what was the reaction? Um, actually, that's kind of a, a term up for debate. People would call me a whistleblower. I would just call myself a truth speaker, but I kind of blew the whistle on myself. You know, I was a, a party to our direct violations of the constitutional rights of an American citizen, Anwar al Even though he wasn't a very nice person, we still killed him. Um, I did that mission for 10 months left six months before he was killed and his son was killed. And um, I felt an extreme amount of guilt after, ab about that because uh, Abdullah Rahman al was a 16-year-old boy from Colorado who ran away from home to find his father. And I'm a man who grew up without a father. So that kind of weighed on me is, is the similarities between us. And um, I really just bl I blew the whistle on myself. I blew the whistle on, on that we were violating the constitutional rights of American citizens. And f to further that, we don't know who we're targeting or why we're targeting. Um, people are playing the game of drones, if you will, mm -hmm. um, and uh, they're getting away with it. And they're lying to the American people. I remember when Abdullah Rahman was killed and I saw President... I was in the U.S. Air Force Reserves when it happened, and I, wa I was watching President Obama on CNN kind of shrug his shoulders and say, oops, that's the guy that I voted into office. That's my commander-in-chief. That's a man who is supposed to take responsibility for the lives of the citizens that he is supposed to be protecting. Like, we have, we have, no, men, we have no men with nobility or honor in our system anymore. So on Anwar al Lucky, he's the father, and and uh, he's a U.S. citizen, and we executed him without trial, without any due process, without ever going to a court. Uh, and I, and I've, if you care about the Constitution, that should be problematic. Doesn't matter where you are on the political spectrum. But on the son, also a U.S. citizen, also executed, also no due, no due process. That is even more problematic. He's a 16 year old kid looking for his dad. Now, the, my real question there is, and I don't know that you can answer this, Brandon. Uh, I'd be very curious if we could ever find the person who could answer this. You're telling me that they accidentally and coincidentally hit the 16-year-old son of the of the dad that we had targeted for a killing. I mean, that has got to be the because they weren't anywhere near each other. It was weeks apart. It was it was not in the same place. That has got to be the most improbable. A coincidence of all time. So this is this goes back to uh, mowing the grass before it grows. Well, they were. I'm I'm guessing this is because I know these people. I know how they think. They, they're thinking to kill this boy before someone picks him up and uses him as some sort of beacon or leader to uh, to come against us. So they they take the consequence of yeah, we'll just kill him and, and shrug our shoulders and say oops, rather than let someone else take him up and let the kid get revenge for his father being murdered. So you don't think that the sixteen year old being killed targeted was an accident? Oh, it was not an accident. <laughs> uh, what have we become? <laughs> That's a good question. All right, one last thing, Brandon. In this regard, we talked about seeing the images. I have in my notes here that that one of the drone operators saw two heads floating in the river uh, after a hit. Um, do you know anything about that? And and how would they have how would they have seen that? Um, you can get pretty close to targets, um, but you you couldn't see detail. I, I think that's kind of one of those things of they were probably told. 
Like they might, they might have actually been bodies or whatever floating in the river, or maybe, maybe human heads have a distinct way that they float down rivers. Um, I'm not quite sure about that. So I mean, because I, the reason I asked that question uh, is, people get a sense of like, okay, th those are the bad guys, and we got to do whatever we can to them. And the reason for that is because they decapitate people and they don't burn people alive and. They do all these gruesome things. I mean, what happens when a drone strike hits someone? Uh, pretty much, you know, they get incinerated. They get blown apart. And killing, killing people is the. Uh, if you, if I was to tell you a lesson that I've learned from my time in the military, it'd be like everyone dies the same, and everyone dies. And what our job as soldiers and warriors should be is to prevent as much of that as possible. But. Um, we can't justify killing of another human being in a, some sort of manner simply because someone else kills him in some other horrific manner. All right, Tanya, let's let's go and conclude on, on a on a macro issue here, which is what can we uh, do about this, and uh, and and why is this being done, and how can it be prevented? I think it's, it's incredibly important that we demand investigations into all the people that have been killed in drone strikes. Uh, we need to hold uh, the administration, the Obama administration, accountable for what they have done. This is incredibly important. Uh, you know, if we are going to stop fueling terrorism around the world, we have to take responsibility for what we have done. And also, it's important to, to realize that the drones are spreading around the world. And it is just a question of time before other nations or groups start using drones. Uh, the U.S. has now been killing thousands of people outside of declared war zones uh, for a long time. And it is time that we have a proper debate about the real consequences of this warfare. Again, I'm sure that there are people in this country, Tanya, that will say, well, it's better than the alternative, so what do you guys want? You want us to not pursue any terrorists? How would you answer that? Well, I think that, you know, because the drones have been sold as is this perfect, surgically precise weapon, uh, people do not really know what is going on. Uh, from working on this issue uh, for a long time and working very closely with drone pilots, it's, it's very obvious that the drone program is broken from the very top to the very bottom. And a lot of innocent people are being killed without us knowing and without transparency around this and accountability. Uh, and I think that's a very, very dangerous example uh, for us to set in the world right now. You know, from from my point of view, I have a lot of opinions on this, of course. But the one thing is that, that I'm absolutely positive about is that if we're going to kill someone, that that should be a very, very weighty process. That yeah. it it should be taken with extreme seriousness, and not something where we're talking about, hey, we're doing body counts and we're going to go get the guys and. Maybe we're going to kill the 16-year-old kids just in case, and we're going to mow the grass, and 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 we're going to take kids from video gaming conferences and tell them to push the button. Tanya, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of those experiments where the that we all read in psychology class, where the where the guy comes in the white lab coat and 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 it seems like you're torturing someone on the other end that you can't see, and it's a person in authority saying press the button, press the button, and most of us keep pressing the button. Yeah. I think that the distance uh, that the, the drones uh, allow us to have, have to the wars that we fight right now, you know, definitely is making killing uh, too easy. And I'm afraid that it's lowering the bar for, for going to war. Uh, and that's also something that is not really discussed. Uh, but what are we going to do, you know, when, for example, uh, Russia or China or Iran start using drones, uh, it is a little bit hard to then start pointing our fingers and demand that other people follow uh, international laws of war. Uh, the law, they have to be followed by everybody. And I think that, you know, for us here, it's also very important to look at how silent Europe has been on this issue. Uh, and that's something that we have uh, been able to do with this film, is to at least spark some debate uh, here. And we now really hope that that will happen in the States as well. It's a great point. Wait till Russia, China, and Iran start using the drones. So this is the future. Unfortunately, does not look any brighter. Whether it's the United States, our allies, or our enemies that are using it. So uh, I want to thank uh, both of you for shining a light on this because the first way to get a fix, of course, 
is to find out what's actually going on. So uh, the documentary is drone. Tanya, thank you for for directing that and bring that and bring that to attention. And Brendan, uh, your courage in coming forward is greatly appreciated. And look, I, I know that. You're broken up about uh, your role in this, and that makes you a decent person. And you shouldn't feel bad about that. You should feel good that you came forward and you were brave enough to share your story, which not a lot of other people have done. So, uh, for what it's worth, on behalf of all the people who care about this, uh, and to the real Americans who want to do the right thing and want to be a shining city on a hill, I want to thank you for them. Thank you. All right, uh, Brandon, uh, Brian, and Tanya Hessen Shea. Thank you so much, guys. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.